Okay, everyone. Um, welcome to the second talk of our of our workshop. Uh, I am very much delighted to welcome uh, Yulia Komsha, who is at Google now. Uh, she did her PhD at Cambridge and uh, and then moved straight into Google. And uh, there she is, one of the few people working on spiking neural networks. So, um, without further ado, Yulia, do you want to take it away? Yes. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be at this workshop, and uh, it's great to to hear also the other speakers who have been doing some really great work in the field. Uh, so I work at Google Research in Zurich, and over there we have um, a pretty small team working on biologically inspired AI. So this project on spiking neural networks is part of that um, research uh, exploration. Uh, and the slides that I'm going to present are about a paper that we published, and you can find it on the archive if you're interested. It has the same title as the slides. All right. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to first give some biological inspiration uh, and motivation for our work. So I'm going to talk about spike timing in the human brain and some interesting studies that uh, talk about this. Then I'm going to present our model, the model that we describe in the paper, which is a biologically inspired model that performs temporal coding. And uh, I'm going to, to give a universal approximation proof, since the title of this workshop is Spiking Networks as Universal Approximators. Uh, I'm just going to give it in simple, so not a lot of complicated math, just so anybody can understand how to go about that. And I'm going to show how this model can learn with back propagation and exact derivatives. And then I'm going to show some results on experiments on some first on some simple Boolean logic problems, and then on image recognition on MNIST, and trying to also reconstruct the images that uh, that it's learned. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to do justice on uh, for this topic in uh, just one or two slides, but um, basically everyone knows that conventional artificial neural networks are inspired by the biological brain. And benchmarks for them are on tasks that are solved by humans or by the biological brain, but they compute in a fundamentally different way compared to, to biological brains. So one thing is that they do synchronous processing. So you, you have to activate all the neurons and you wait for each of them to, to, to compute something in order to go further. And there's no true temporal dimension, no true temporal coding, even if there are LSTMs or recurrent networks and you can train them by unfolding them over time, it still has fixed time steps. So there's there's no true temporal encoding in them. Uh, whereas in biological spiking neural networks, um, as we all know, neurons communicate through action potentials, which are all or none signals. So uh, I think everybody, everybody knows by now what this looks like. So uh, this is uh, the main brain potential, uh, if a stimulus comes in, if it's not strong enough, then nothing happens, basically. Uh, whereas if it's strong enough, then the membrane is depolarized and an action potential is produced, then the membrane is repolarized. There's a refractory period in which the neuron doesn't, um, cannot spike, and then it goes back to its resting state. So the action potential is sent along the axon and it further um, sends signals to, to other neurons. So this type of computing is asynchronous. And crucially, with this kind of computing, you can encode information in the temporal patterns of activity. Uh, and another feature of, uh, of biological networks is that they have states. So the brain is not just taking in inputs and processing them and giving outputs all the time, but it's rather something that has a state. So the inputs just influence and are processed according to the state that the brain is in. Um, there's this theory, for example, called predictive coding, which says that the brain is trying to make a model of reality, and with every input, basically, it uses every input in order to adjust its model of, of the world. Um, and of course, with this kind of, uh, of computing, uh, you have um, energy efficiency, which I'm not going to talk about in detail. I think there will be other talks where this will go into more detail. Uh, so now, if you think about uh, biological neurons, you can ask, okay, how is information encoded? So the most widely held view is that of rate coding. So 
early in physiology, when people were trying to do experiments and seeing what cells respond to, they noticed that there are cells that respond preferentially to certain input features, like lines with certain orientations, for example. Uh, and they also noticed that those particular cells fired more when they were shown a stimulus that was that that was close to 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 their preferred input. So the closer it got, the more that cell fired. So this led to this model of rate coding where neurons fire with some probability that's proportional to the strength of the stimulus. And uh, this is a um, widely held view. And this sort of encoding can be very reliable, but it can also be very slow since you have to wait for, for accumulation over, over spikes. And uh, an alternative view uh, that some people have been interested in recently is uh, that of temporal coding. So this is the idea that information is encoded in the relative timing of spikes, not in the rate. So uh, relative timing to what? It, it can be relative to other neurons around one neuron or relative to brain rhythms. Now, there's some debate about brain rhythms and some people say that they're uh, an epiphenomenon, but uh, anyway, this is, this is just one possibility. And temporal coding means that um, the spikes are fired with very high temporal precision. And also this allows very fast information processing because you don't need to accumulate you might uh if you if you need to you might act just on the basis of the timing of a single spike so i want to present some evidence from some biological studies that show that temporal coding is used in biological brains and can be uh, quite interesting to think about so there's a series of studies by thorpe and invert and their lab so they wanted to see uh, how short does can a stimulus be so that we still recognize it, so a visual stimulus. So, for example, if you present images of objects, uh, if you present them for only 100 milliseconds, you, you can still recognize the object. And by doing experiments uh, showing images to people very fast, uh, they estimated that there's a repertoire of at least 100,000 objects that can be recognized by presenting them for only 100 milliseconds. Um, so this is quite interesting and then you can ask, okay, so how does this work? How many neurons uh, need to spike in order for this to happen? So here, what you can do is, uh, for example, in, in the macaque monkey, you can record uh, neuron spikes at, um, um, for example, in the, te in the temporal lobe, you can see when neurons in the temporal lobe fire spikes that are informative about the presented image. And uh, so you know that an image is presented and it has to go through a certain pathway through the visual cortex. Um, so basically, you know how many synaptic stages there are between the presentation and the neurons that you recorded in the temporal lobe. And then you measure when, when are those spikes being fired uh, after 10 synaptic stages. And then you can say, OK, so how long does it take for an action potential to be fired? How, what is the signal, uh, the speed of the signal propagation through, through, through the axons and through, through the whole pathway? And then basically, you can compute that, um, that, that the response can be made with, with around one spike per, per stage. So th this is just the first response. So basically, single spikes seem to be uh, informative and seem to carry some information. Uh, then, of course, this is not to say it's just temporal encoding and it only works like this. So then, of course, there's room for waiting for more evidence to accumulate and for um, feedback connections to also influence um, the, the information of the signal that's being propagated. But it seems that the first response can indeed be made or there's some information for the first response on the basis of just single spikes, just based on me measuring uh, the speed of firing. Uh, then another kind of experiment that has been done was uh, looking at spikes in the retina. Uh, usually it's the, I've seen studies with retinas of salamanders. Um, so there are the studies showing that uh, retinal spikes are highly reproducible and they convey more information through their timing rather than their spike count then the fact that uh, retinal cells can encode the spatial so it can discriminate between images through their the relative timing of their first spikes uh, 
Then in the human fingertips, um, there's information about the fingertip force and the shape of the surface, also in the relative timing of the first spikes. Um, and then there's, there's another argument that you can make if you think about uh, STDP learning. So uh, STDP means that basically if, if, if there's a spike um, and if there are inputs that are very close to that spike, then the connection is reinforced between them. But if you think about it, if you keep giving the same input that causes uh, an output neuron to fire, then if the connection keeps being reinforced, then you don't need as many spikes in order for, for the neuron to spike. And if you keep presenting it, then eventually the output neuron is going to spike on the basis of a single input neuron, if you've presented it enough times and if you reinforce the connection uh, enough. So from this, this suggests that it can be that uh, in some cases, you can act on the basis of single spikes because of this kind of learning. Uh, and another interesting topic is uh, that of the of phase precession in the hippocampus. So uh, the Nobel Prize in 1993 was awarded for the discovery of this. Uh, in the red brain and probably also in the human brain, there's an ongoing theta rhythm in the hippocampus. And it's been discovered that in the hippocampus, there are place cells and grid cells. So place cells fire when the animal is at specific locations in, in the room, whereas grid cells fire also at specific locations, but in a grid-like pattern. So for example, in this image, you can show, you can see, so this is a 2D space where the animal is, and the red blobs are the places where a certain cell fire, fires. Uh, this is a model, but in recordings, it looks sort of similar. Uh, so this is pretty remarkable. This shows that there is some um, um, code for 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 encoding the map of a, of a location in the red. And the interesting thing is that the spikes of place cells and grid cells are timed with respect to the theta rhythm. This is called uh, phase precession. Um, so basically, the closer the animal gets to the preferred activation location uh, of that cell, the earlier with respect to the theta rhythm that cell fires. So this is pretty interesting again. And uh, this is again not to say that this is only about rate coding or time coding. It can be that in different parts of the brain or different types of stimuli are processed differently or there's different kind of computation arising uh, on the basis of different codes. So there are ways to also turn rate encoding to time encoding and time encoding to rate encoding, which you can find, for example, in these references. Uh, so this is, this is basically to say that information can be encoded in the relative timing of single spikes. So this is just a, an interesting model to think about how the brain computes. So we wondered how can I translate this to artificial neural network? So I want to, to acknowledge some previous work, um, so spike prep, and uh, some, some authors of, of this work are in this workshop and have given our will give talks. Uh, so spike prep was probably the first model with temporal coding with single spikes and approximated derivatives. And uh, there were extensions to, to, sp to the spike prep. Um, then there's a nice paper by Mustafa from 2017 that showed how you can do temporal coding with single spikes and backpropagation, uh, unfortunately with non-leaky neurons. And I've also seen papers that do SDP and reinforcement learning that also do temporal coding, but they don't learn with backpropagation. <coughs> okay, so how to encode a problem if you want to uh, to do temporal coding. So the idea is that earlier spikes encode more salient information. So for example, if you have a, an, a digit, an MNIST digit, then you have an input uh, size of 28 times 28. And where there's no information, uh, or so every neuron corresponds to, to, to an input pixel. So there are 28 times 28 neurons, each corresponding to an input pixel. And in the places where there's no information, the neurons just don't spike. Whereas in the places where there is information, um, 
the darker color represents earlier spike times. So in the center of the shape, uh, there's more salient information, so neurons spike faster, whereas at the edges, um, they spike later because the information is not as important or it might be noise. So if you consider a classification problem with m inputs and n possible classes, you can encode the, the problem in n input neurons that spike at a time proportional to the maybe strength of the stimulus or some other characteristic of, of the input. And in order to decode this, in the case of digits, you can have 10 output neurons and we can classify the input as class uh, 5 if and only if the fifth neuron spikes earliest. Okay, so in our work, we were inspired by postsynaptic potentials recorded in real cells that look like this. So this is an example of an excitatory potential and this is inhibitory. And it has this shape that has a fast rise and slow decay. Uh, so we decided to use in the model uh, the alpha function, which is t times e to the power t and is parameterized by uh, decay rate. So this function looks like this. So it has a fast rise and slow decay. And this is the equation that describes a membrane potential with weighted um, inputs. And in this example, you can see how the membrane potential changes uh, as it receives a number of inputs, most of them excitatory, so with positive weights, and one input with negative weight, so inhibitory. OK. so. To, to sum up the model, we have the alpha synaptic function, which is parameterized by a custom decay and uh, by a weight. <clears throat> so in this graph, you can see this is the, the orange line is the baseline, and you can see how the decay rate and the weight change the shape of this. So um, the decay rate basically scales the function both horizontally and vertically, whereas the weight scales it vertically. Uh, and we have a fixed firing threshold and biological networks it can be adaptive but in this case we we make it uh, fixed and so this is this has the advantage of being both a biologically inspired model and it allows rich temporal dynamics uh, it's maybe a bit more computationally intensive than other models but we wanted to show that it's possible to do to do it with this and um so it's important that that the neuron is is leaky because this allows forgetting input so this allows more interesting uh interplay of temporal dynamics as the inputs are forgotten okay so the how do we compute the spike time of a neuron basically this is the this is our equation that the mem membrane potential for a given set of inputs equals the firing threshold and then we if you do the math, you get this uh, equation for computing the output spike time. This is the Lambert W function. Uh, and A and B here are depend on the weights and on the input spike times. Uh, so what is a bit tricky here is to, to find the correct set of inputs uh, that determines the neuron to spike, because you might predict the spike and then another spike might come in between. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, but basically, we sort and add the spikes one by one, and we get the output spike time. And a neuron may not spike. And in the model that we present here, uh, every neuron spikes at most once. So another thing that we introduce are synchronization pulses, uh, which are sets of neurons that are connected to each non-input layer. They can be shared between layers, or they can be individually connected to, to different layers. So these pulses, they act like temporal biases, so they sort of give a time reference for the network. And they're also important in ensuring that eventually there are spikes across the whole network. And this will turn out to be very important during the learning process, as you will see. And uh, so the pulses have learnable spike times and weights uh, in the same way that I will show a bit later um, that the regular neurons and weights are, are being learned. OK, so now I'm going to give a sketch of the universal approximation proof for, for this model, uh, just in, in very easy terms. So the problem is given a well-behaved function f with n inputs and one output, find a spiking network that approximates f within epsilon. So a network that spikes at time f of, of the given input plus minus epsilon. Uh, 
Um, so the firing threshold and the decay rate are fixed. So basically, we are looking for an architecture that can solve this problem. So I'm going to show three steps. First, we express smaller than and greater than. Then we express intervals or hypercubes. And then we split the function domain into intervals or hypercubes in order to, to make the approximation. OK, so in step one, we show that we can build networks that can express the input is smaller than a constant t by producing a, sp a spike at uh, approximately a time t out that we decide. So the key thing to, to see here is that if you have two input spikes with opposite weights, so exactly the same weight but with opposite sign, then when they are summed, the potential is zero. But if you move one spike earlier than the other, then the sign of the potential will, will be the sign of the spike that came later. So um, we set the input weight to, to something negative, to minus w, uh, w, and then we add a pulse at time t, which is the t that, that we're making the comparison to. Um, and we set the, the weight of p1 to, to uh, w. So if the input comes before p1, then eventually the sum potential is going to be positive. And if t1 comes after p1, then the potential is going to be negative. It might be just slightly negative, but we're just interested in the sign. OK, uh, so this means that eventually this potential is going to be positive if and only if this condition is fulfilled. So if the input came before uh, t. And then what we do is very, very close to t out since we're approximating. So it's just very, very close, not exactly. Um, we add two pulses, one pulse P2 with a very, very large weight that almost instantly raises the potential to the firing threshold. And then another pulse P3 with very large negative weight that comes exactly at the time when P2 would hit the, the firing threshold if the potential were zero. So basically this means that the neuron is going to fire due to P2 if and only if the potential uh, is going to be positive. The sign of the potential is positive which only happens if ti came before p1. Okay, if the potential is even slightly negative, then p3 is going to stop um, the neuron from firing. All right, and we can do the, the same kind of reasoning also for the other condition that a spike is larger than, than some given uh, constant t. So you can see here how, how the sign of the potential changes. Uh, so this is the sum between p1 and ti. And you can see that there's a spike if and only if ti is um, in the blue area. OK, so now in step two, we combine the networks that we obtained in step one using an end, and we express this kind of conditions. Uh, so basically, in the previous step, we solved a problem that is the input before or after t1 is the input before or after t2. So we can combine this condition. So we can say um, t1, uh, so we can make the same network that we did before to, to express that um, t1 is greater than t, uh, t capital one and smaller than t2. Um, and then for the second input, you can do the same. So basically you obtain these um, squares if you want, or hypercubes if you go into, into multiple dimensions. Um, and in all the, all the cases, you can reuse uh, P2 and P3 because you want everything to spike at approximately the same time. So now you have this kind of network. And basically, all you have to do now to do the end is to assign the weights in such a way that the neuron is going to spike if and only if of all the inputs spike at the same time or approximately at the same time. OK, and now finally, in step three, uh, we split the function domain into equally sized hypercubes, and then we approximate the function in each hypercube using what we had at step two. And as we refine the subdivision, the approximate becomes more and more accurate. And you can see here an example. This is approximating the target function with a little bit of noise that I think you cannot see here. But um, basically, the the more you split it, the the more hypercubes you have, the better the approximation is. Um, so uh, just a technical detail that if the function is Lipschitz, which means there's a bound to how much the functional value changes, basically, then we can bound the number of subdivisions. So that is the number of neurons required for approximating the function to epsilon to 
this number, where k is the Lipschitz constant. Uh, if you want more mathematical details, then you can look at our paper. All right, so now that we have this model, um, we can use backward propagation to, to teach it. So the usual problem with spiking networks is that the spike events are not differentiable. Um, but temporal coding overcomes this problem. Um, so basically here, the learning goal is to adjust the timing of the outputs, but the timing of the outputs depends on the timing of the inputs. So recall that this was the solution to the equation that we had before. So basically T out depends on, on the weights, WI, and on TI, which are hidden in A and B here. So basically you can take the deriv derivatives of this and they don't look so pretty, but they're computable. So um, this is what, what we get in the end. And so once we have the setup, we can just do what we do for conventional networks. We can use an optimizer and minimize the cross entropy loss. In our case, we use the atom optimizer. And uh, the difference is that in the output layer, we want to minimize as opposed to maximize the spike time. So for this, we do a softmax on the negative spike times just to add a minus that is going to propagate and make everything um, uh, and, and minimize things instead of maximize them. OK, so some training challenges, challenges that we had were uh, the following. First of all, initialization is very important with spiking networks. So enough neurons should spike in the beginning that um, there's some gradient that starts flowing in enough neurons, basically. And for this, we use the modified blur addition initialization. Um, so we had the standard deviation depending on the number of inputs and outputs, but also a custom mean for, for the, the distribution from which the weights are drawn. Um, and this also actually, this, this allows some neurons to specialize into, or to, to be encouraged to be uh, inhibitory or excitatory if you put a negative or a positive mean. Um, then the other problem is that as the, member, as the membrane potential approach, approaches the threshold, so the neuron barely spikes or barely doesn't spike, then the derivatives approach infinity. And to avoid this problem, we have a hyperparameter that clips the derivative. Um, some things that helped with training were, uh, quite surprisingly, updating the network only when the class classification was wrong. So if we had some inputs that uh, were classified correctly, we, if we didn't touch the network, so if we didn't encourage it to learn even more the distinction, then um, we got better results. And also very small batch sizes worked better. Uh, and we're not sure why, actually, maybe this is something we might discuss during the, the discussion if the other speakers might have similar experiences. So uh, some other ideas that we explored but that didn't lift improvements were regularization in the form of weight decay or adding random noise to inputs or to, to hidden neurons or to pulses. We also tried something brain-inspired um, or retina-inspired to add bipolar neurons that respond to um, so, so for the same pixel, one neuron that responds to brightness and one neuron that resp responds to darkness, basically. But this didn't seem to help. And we also tried uh, to ease the computation by forgetting inputs when they decay below threshold. But this also didn't seem to help. OK, so now I'm going to show some results that we got. So first of all, we tried very simple networks on very simple problems. So we had the uh, and or and XOR and concentric circles encoded in time with spike times between zero and one. And, and we had very small networks, so with just two hidden uh, neurons and one synchronization pulse connected to all the non-input layers. And this is what the classification boundaries look like. So for each problem, for example, for and, we have the first input spike time and the second, in second input spike time. So this basically represents the values of the two inputs. And this is the classification boundary that we got for each problem. And uh, yeah, just an example of, of how it works. Um, here I'm, I'm plotting the timing um, in the hidden layer and in the output layer. So the orange line represents the pulse, which was connected to the whole network. Then these are the hidden neurons. So as the inputs come at two times, they cause a different increase in the membrane potential, and it goes to spikes over here. 
And then the in the output neuron, you, you have the spikes of the hidden neurons. Um, and actually, in this picture, it looks as if the network spikes, um, the two, two output neurons spike at the same time. It looks like they're the same. But actually, basically, the nef network learned how to barely discriminate between the two. So the classification is constantly um, correct. It's just that the timing is, is very, very close. And in this case, um, for this problem, is because we didn't encourage the network. So we didn't train the network if an output was classified correctly, only if, if, it, if it was uh, incorrect. So this leads to this kind of behavior. OK, so then we did an experiment on uh, MNIST digits. So this is handwritten digit recognition. And uh, we did a hyperparameter search. So these are the parameters that we had, the decay constant, the fire threshold, number of hidden layers, number of pulses per layer, a multiplier for, for the initialization of the weights of the pulses and regular neurons, a different learning rate for the network weights and the pulse um, timings, and then the batch size for the optimization, the clipping value for derivatives so they don't reach infinity, and the uh, um, penalty added to presnip the weights if a neuron didn't fire, so basically boosting weights if the neuron didn't fire. So some things that I want to draw attention to here are the fact that uh, for the weight initialization, the chosen value was negative for non-pulses, so for the regular neurons in the network, and positive for the pulses. So this means that basically the pulses were encouraged to be excitatory, whereas the non-pulses were encouraged to be inhibitory slightly. And the other thing is that the batch size that was chosen was very small. Uh, so as I said, larger batch sizes didn't help. Um, OK. so. In, in this experiment, based on the hyperparameter search, we had the reasonably small network with one hidden layer with 340 neurons and 10 synchronization pulses. The digits were encoded at spike times between 0 and 1. And the pulses were connected to each layer and were initialized to spike at evenly distributed times between 0 and 1. And uh, the results were that, uh, so we got uh, almost 98% accuracy on MNIST. And for comparison, we trained a, a non-convolutional, to be fair, a non-convolutional ReLU network that had uh, basically a similar accuracy. And one thing that was pretty interesting that we did not expect and that we discovered during training is that the same network spontaneously switched between a slow but accurate operating regime and a very fast but slightly less accurate operating regime. So you can see here the difference in accuracies in the slow regime is 97.96, and in the fast regime is a maximum 97.4. Uh, and it's not a big difference, but it's consistently lower. So we looked, we made a plot uh, across epochs for the same network, basically, and we looked at spike times in the various layers. So in the first part, in this part, uh, the slow classification part, uh, we had the inputs coming and then the hidden layer activating and then there's the first output spike and then then the mean output spike. Um, and afterwards, at some point at this epoch, there's there's a change where the where accuracy just goes down to three percent and then the whole network starts operating differently. And you can see here that the first spike time, the purple line, now happens before even the mean um, spike has the mean spike of the of the hidden layer. So this is very fast classification. Um, so uh, in these pictures, you can see this, the specific um, spike times um, of, of the neurons in each layer when classifying a, a specific digit. So this is the same digit that's being classified in the slow regime and in the fast regime. Uh, the orange lines are pulses. Here you can see the input spikes, then hidden spikes. And then you can see that the slow network makes the classification after everything else has spiked. Um, whereas in the fast regime, you can see that the classification is made even before all, all the input neurons have finished spiking. So this is really, really fast. And you can also see here that the second guess of the network's network was a 3. So it's quite interesting that you can see what the second guess of the network is, or so what it was more confident about, and so on. Um, so we wondered why this happened, because we didn't hard code this change from slow to fast regime. And we noticed that 
This change was likely produced by fluctuations in pulse timings caused by a relatively high learning rate as chosen by the hyperparameter search. So basically at some point, all the pulses synchronized at the sort of, uh, at, at the very early stage. And then that somehow just flips the operation mode of the network. Um, okay, I think I should try to wrap up. Um, so uh, this this finding was interesting because uh, in human decision making as well, you have the same speed accuracy trade off where you either wait for more information and you make a more um, accurate decision or you make a decision very fast, but often it will be less accurate because you have less information. Uh, so one other thing that we looked at was um, at how how the output neurons were were behaving and what the inputs look like, and we noticed that there was a lot of uh, in inhibition, so negative weights uh, in most of the non-pulse neurons, whereas the pulses were actually excitatory. Um, and finally, one other thing we tried was. Uh, to reconstruct the data. So this is something you can do with any network, not just spiking networks. Um, so what you can do is you set the input to blank or just noise. Then you set the target in the output layer. So you want to generate a three. And then you gradually adjust using the same kind of derivatives as, as for back propagation learning. You gradually just gradually adjust the input to minimize the target output spike time. And uh, you have to adjust the parameters a little bit and be careful and not adjust too much at once. But basically, you can do something like stop when the correct class is produced for some number of consecutive epochs. And these are some examples of data like 0, 1, 3, 7 that the network uh, generated. OK, so to conclude, um, the timing of single spikes can efficiently encode information in the brain, which we saw from um, multiple um, studies um, in biology. Um, we've shown a model of a spiking network with a biologically inspired neuron model and that does temporal coding, which can be trained with back propagation and can perform digit recognition and competi at competitive accuracies. And uh, we think this, this is interesting from a multidisciplinary perspective. So uh, one thing is that it can shed light on the representational capabilities of biological light networks. And, and this is what I think is, so for me personally, this is the the more interesting part, but uh, it's also interesting from the perspective of, of neuromorphic computing and advancing this field in general. And we have some open, open source code if you're interested in, in playing with this. And I want to thank my colleagues from Google who helped with this project. And I think I'm ready for questions. Great. Thank you very much, Shilia. Um, I think you're, you're, you're only going to hear me clapping, unfortunately, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that everyone in the audience was, uh, was similarly appreciative. There's lots of questions on the, on the rotor. Um, okay, all right. So I will start off with the first one. So the first question is um, saying you're using alpha-shaped uh, postsynaptic potentials. Uh, have you considered conductance-based synapses? Um, because that's more like how real neurons work. Oh, and also now we're seeing uh, as as, uh, um, as as the chat catches up, you can see that the the, the audience is all clapping. You can see the uh, little emoji scrolling past. <laughs> oh, great! <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I didn't. Uh, sorry, I didn't answer the question. Can I see? It? So I'm looking at the the question. Yes, it's the top, it's the top yeah. voted question. Um, um, so it's so, the, so they're asking about alpha shaped um, post synapse oh, right. potentials and conductance-based synapses. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So no, we didn't try other models, but uh, yeah, I think indeed it's great to move in a more biologically uh, inspired direction and it would be great to see more work in this field, but we haven't tried. But yeah, okay. good question. Okay, great. Um, all right, so the next voted one was actually my one. Um, so I was wondering if, so you use the sync, sync pulses basically to generate activity. Could, could noise work just as well by just adding a bit of noise so that you just get some random firing or? Um, not really. So we actually tried this and we didn't uh, really see that noise helped. So we tried multiple ways of, of adding noise. So we tried adding noise to the inputs, adding noise to uh, non-input neurons, uh, 
we tried adding noise to the pulses, we tried with less pulses, so it didn't seem like noise really helps. So the point is that with synchronization pulses, they are learned, so their timing is learned and their weight is also learned. So this thing you could not have with noise. So there's some extra information that goes into the pulses that's important. Okay, so it's not just a case of it, it generates activity, it's actually doing some function, yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, the next one is, um, so um, Gentine asks, in the import is, is the importance of in the importance for timing for salient information, uh, wouldn't you think the edges are more important than the middle shape of the S? I'm not sure I quite understand, um, but maybe you get it. Yeah, I think I understand this question. So maybe the point is that uh, that it's important whether I don't know the edges might might change them. So when you have a four or a nine, for example then the edges might be important in distinguish distinguishing between the two, I guess. Now, uh, I don't know. So this is a question of interpretation. Now, this is just a way to, to encode things with a spiking network and temporal coding. But in in the brain, so we're not saying this is what the brain does. It's just, a, I mean, I think it's just a matter of interpretation. And you, you, could, you could encode things differently. Um, on the other hand, we tried. Um, adding as i mentioned we tried adding sort of bipolar neurons so two neurons with the same receptive field that responded to opposite brightness so one responded to brightness and one responded to darkness um so that didn't seem to help in this case but it might be that um also in other data sets you can encode things differently for better accuracy yeah it's a totally valid idea okay um all right so I think that you answered the next question, but I'll just quickly answer it since it's a bit of one of our votes, which is um, how can you decode the spikes into analog values to use the SNN for regression? I guess you used it for classification um, so far and they're asking about regression. Yeah, and uh, I think you can, I mean, you can just change, the, just, I think you can do it just like in a regular network. So if you, if you put things like this in, with temporal coding and you do the sort of optimization, you can just use the same um, training setup that you would use for a conventional network to, to do regression. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think uh, we'll see lots of different schemes from, from different speakers in this workshop. So that should give some ideas for that. Um, all right, so Daniel asked the next question, which is uh, it's about oscillation. So he says, theta is a very important oscillator in the hippocampus, but there's also slow gamma at 30 hertz, which is enriched during exploratory behavior in mice. Do you think multiple phase codes could exist in parallel at the same time? And if so, what kind of functions might that support? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So indeed, so for example, one piece of research that I saw about this was um, something like uh, um, using theta and gamma oscillations for short-term memory to encode objects. So basically, the the gamma waves um, being used to to encode objects within the the theta cycles. Um, yeah. So I I don't know a lot about this, but yes, I think there is a bit of research in this area and. I think there are lots of things that, that we don't um, really know. And there are also many things that arise, maybe they're epiphenomena. So some people think that brain rhythms are just epiphenomena, that they don't necessarily play a role. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very interesting question. And I think there are many things that, that we don't know about how it works. There's some research, and for example, with short term memory. I'm sure there, there's more about it. OK. Um, all right, so the next uh, question is from Tim uh, Maskelier, who uh, I guess is the person who's done the work that's most similar to this. He's also um, done some work on training the output spike times with, with a single spike sort of assumption. Um, and he's asking if you train only the weights or do you also train the time scales of the alpha functions? And, uh, and Friedemann throws in an extra question as well, which is um, do you train those time scales individually or are they all tied? Um, so we've got a, a no, bunch of questions we, there. <laughs> we just train the synaptic weights and the timing of the pulses. That's all. Um, other parameters, 
uh, we said during the hyperparameter search. So there's some a bit of um, tinkering there, but during once we set the parameters of the network, we only train the synaptic weights. Okay. And also, so in in this model, all the neurons have the same parameters, basically. You, you could have a model with different parameters for different neurons and adjust them, but then you would have a lot of parameters and we found that it's not really necessary. It could be useful for um, other more complex data sets, maybe. Okay. Um, so for the next question, I'm hoping that someone is going to come on screen. Um, Laurent, Laurent Perinet has said that he could come on screen, but uh, I might just wait to wait for a few seconds to see if he answers. Um, Tim, Tim in the chat says, okay, thanks to that one. Okay, well, while, while we wait for, for Laurent to answer that, I'll ask the, the next one. Um, so. Um, Colin is asking, I'm not quite understanding how temporal encoding overcomes non-differentiability of spikes. I know this is the point of the work, but could you recap this part? Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the idea is that in order to do backpropagation, so in backpropagation and gradient learning, you want to adjust some parameters of the network based on the output. So you know in, the, in which direction you want to change the output. And based on that direction, you adjust the parameters in the network to make that direction more likely. Um, so with temporal coding, you want to adjust the timing of spikes. But you know that the timing of spikes depends on the timing of the input spikes of those spikes and so on. So you can back, back propagate this. And it also depends on the weights. So you can also have derivative with respect to the weights. Okay. Actually, I had a follow-up on that, which is, what, uh, I think you said it, but I missed it, which was, what do you do when there shouldn't be an output spike? Um, we don't have, do always have one because, yeah, so we always want there to be an, an output spike, basically. Um, so we find that in this model, because we're minimizing the desired spike time and maximizing the spikes that we don't want, we end up with the important things spiking quite fast. And then um, there are also spikes in the neurons that don't uh, reflect the correct class, but they fire later. So technically, we could then just remove um, the pulses that cause them to spike, because it's mostly pulses that eventually make them spike. So we find that there's a, there's a so we could just change the network in order to have only, uh, only the important spikes occurring. But there's no case in, in this model where we don't want something to spike it explicitly. OK, yeah. Uh, all right, so I think we have um, Laurent on the screen now to, to ask the next one. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, cool. It's great to have uh, 400 people uh, looking at this uh, workshop. Thanks, Dan and Freeman for this. Um, my question is just that um, it looks very impressive to, uh, to have this network working. It seems to work on discrete time. And I can imagine that you can uh, implement a neuron that will be a second order linear equation that will implement these alpha functions. And But from, the, from your computation of the output spikes, could you uh, uh, implement a version which will be event-based, where you will not need to have the uh, computation at every discrete time, but that you will have only the computation of the spike times and do the computation at all, only these times, which would be very important for neuromorphic chips. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you, you could do it, basically. So we just have this because we have a single spike per neuron, and we just have the model set up in such a way that you can just do everything fit forward. But yes, in this model, just nothing stops you from accumulating spikes at every neuron as they come and just having an event-based implementation. Yes, it's possible. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, great. Okay, I, th I think we're actually already running over quite a few minutes, so I think let's just make it one last question. Um, so we have... Someone asking, they say, basically, uh, you mentioned relative time of first spikes, and they say relative to what? And I, I guess the question is, so in, in your formulation, it, it makes sense because everything only spikes once. There's only one spike window, so it's it actually isn't really relative. It's relative to the start of the thing. But I guess they're asking, what would the more general setting here be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can have two things here. So either 
neurons that spike relative to each other, so maybe that encode uh, competing information. So if something encodes red and something encodes blue, then if red spikes, then the blue doesn't spike and is inhibited, for example. So you can have this sort of local competition. But also um, in the human brain, um, as in the example of the hippocampus, with the phase precession, the spikes can be relative to the brain rhythms that occur in that area. So um, actually, maybe maybe I can show the slide where I answered this question. Um, yeah, so is this slide, I haven't shown a, a picture of this, but basically the spikes of place cells and grid cells are timed with respect to the theta rhythm. So they fire earlier with respect to, to the theta rhythm phase when the animal is closer to the preferred um, um, receptive field of that cell. Okay, yeah, okay, great. Um, I think we probably have to leave it there. I've run uh, uh, eight minutes over, over what we said. Um, what I'll do is I'll leave the session open. I'll, I'll end the broadcast. I'll leave the session open. And, and Yulia, if you, if you feel up to it, you could hang around and maybe ask the answer the remaining questions cool. in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I don't know, do you, do you have a Twitter account people could maybe follow up with for, the, for some of the other questions or whatever you um, would like, really? Yeah, so I have a Twitter account. It's not very active, but my Google it. Maybe I can just write it somewhere. Um, sure, yeah, if you just write that in the chat. Um, um, OK, so I'm brilliant. happy to receive any questions. And we also have, so I had the link to the open source code. And I think if you if you Google this, then uh, you will find our work online. And thank yes, you very so much. Someone, someone shared the, the, the link to, the, to your code earlier already. So we've, we've had that in the chat. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you very much again, and uh, thank you from everyone. Yeah, um, thank you very much. It's, it's been great. Thanks. <laughs> that's great. All right. And to everyone else, uh, we will be back, I think, in about 20 minutes' time. OK. All right. Enjoy the break. Bye for now. Bye.